All right, Jim Walmsley, it's great to meet, and it is great to have you on the Single Track Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been uh, been some long time coming, and glad to finally make it on the show. Right on. Well, let's get right into it. One of the characteristics about you that impresses me so much over the years is just your general willingness to be public about your goals and furthermore, to be held accountable to those goals as well. And I think you've described it in that recent Wahoo film, like Babe Ruth calling his shot, which I loved. And uh, I'm curious, where does that mindset come from? Like, does it come naturally to you? Has it been trained over the years as a competitor? Talk about that. Um, I think it kind of goes to a bit of my, I, I feel it's honesty more than anything. Like someone asks what your goal is. Um, my goal is not to be here and participate. I have a more competitive approach to it. And my goal at many of these races, I'm fortunate enough to kind of say like my, my goal is to try to win it. Um, I, I don't really care to beat around the bush around that. So um, I, I just kind of see it as a genuine honesty from my end. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with goals. And um, yeah, most people aren't going to win it. And a lot of times I don't win it. So it, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. But uh, I think that's kind of what gets motivation going. And and yeah, sometimes maybe putting it out there in the world also helps fire that stoke and um, keeps you account. Like it's a self accountability whole circle to it um, with the whole process. So it's not necessarily intentional or anything that I'm trying to do boastfully, but uh, I think it motivates me and motivates me to to aim for big things. You moved to France earlier this year to test the theory that the way to win UTMB is to train like the Euros train. So I think we're about three or yeah. four months into that experiment. What's the experience been like so far? And I guess like besides specificity, are you are you getting any other benefits that you couldn't get training in the US? Yeah. So I've been here about two and a half months. And um, I mean, honestly, this year it seems more like I've just come out here from my training block more than um, moving to France at this point. I don't think I've had a full Euro approach at this point in time. The biggest adjustments have probably come in choosing to not race in like January, February, like many years I do, or like it's very common in the US, I think with mm -hmm. our weather. Um, we kind of have the opportunity to race in the winter in a lot of places, especially if you're from a moderate winter sort of place to train. Um, you have kind of a bit of an advantage, and that kick starts your season really early, especially if your last season just bled over from the end of the year, um, kind of going into early winter, November, December. If you rebound with January, February, I mean, you don't have much of a break off season um, naturally created by uh, seasons. Um, and then, so not doing a race early uh, was a bit purposeful this year. Um, then mm -hmm. choosing my first race this year uh, at Madeira Island Ultra Trail, um, just kind of with the style and thought that uh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hiking. It's going to go through the night. Um, there's some travel involved. Um, and then it was kind of a new, exciting challenge and, uh, yeah, so Mandira went really well in April, um, ended up running probably faster than I thought I would on paper. Um, after seeing the course, I mean, it's pretty technical and kind of lives up to its reputation quite a bit and was a bit happily surprised that I was able to train for that in Flagstaff, um, and and even with our winter there too, it's harder for us in Flagstaff to get up in the mountains and actually get a lot of our vertical spots that we're hitting. Um, but we're also able to get the Grand Canyon uh, in March, February, March, April really well, um, where in the summer, uh, the Grand Canyon is a double-edged sword and it kind of gets right. too hot to really be in the canyon a lot for UTMB stuff. So um, we have Humphreys that opens up uh, probably in July-ish, uh, June, I would say June, just before Western States usually. And then, um, but it was a lot of little small climbs that we have in 
on Elden. That's kind of from my back door in Flagstaff. And that one felt like a, a lot of repetitions of the same hills. But it's a difficult race to get ready for for a lot of places in the world. Um, with uh, like even, I think, being in a rush before where I am in, here in France, um, it would be a challenge to get to prepare for. And it's been funny to hear some of Francois's stories of uh, him pointing out a hill and it's like the only hill that doesn't have snow on it in March, April. And he's like, that's the only hill I got for Madeira. <laughs> and it's like, man, that's worse than what we had available in Flagstaff. So, um, and then, so not doing a race in January, February, early season, um, doing a more specific race in April, uh, that was more like UTMB. And then, uh, probably the third really big thing that's not relevant to a lot of the changes that I made was, um, I didn't run Western States this year. So this will be my first time running UTMB without running Western States beforehand. And I've never, uh, finished both races in the same year. Um, I think the one time I finished UTMB and took fifth, I didn't finish Western States that year in 2017. And then, um, 2018 and 2021, uh, I finished Western States, but I also didn't finish UTMB, uh, two months later. So it's kind of hard not to connect those two lines, um, to those two dots and kind of look at it as a pretty big elephant of like maybe putting those many eggs into Western States affects your race two weeks later. Um, and I kind of describe that, especially to Europeans too, that us as Americans, we love Western States. I think we need to keep it that way, but, um, it affects our, our performance two months later. And the fact that like we put everything in the Western States and then you just kind of roll the dice. I'm like, well, we'll see what we got left and we'll, we'll, we'll go to Chamonix and do something there and we'll, we'll see how it goes. And more times than not, um, that's been a difficult turnaround. Um, but you also have people like Seth Swanson or David Laney right. that have done really, really well, um, with that double, but, um, they didn't win either. So there's also that like kind of obvious point as well. Um, that when you're putting in so much energy to try to take just from going second or third to first place sometimes just takes a lot more effort out of you. And then just combined with the attention in between the two races, um, that kind of comes with that, uh, can be more stress. Well, it puts in my mind, it puts Francois hard rock UTMB double in perspective too. like his ability to turn it around in six weeks well, and to, to win Xavier UTMB last was year. kind of the first one to do that. Xavier too. Yeah. To close the loop on this location question, I'm curious because it does seem this year more than normal. There's a greater percentage of American elites coming over super early to the French Alps to get ready. Um, was there any scenario in your mind where training somewhere in the U United States for this race made any sense and would have made you confident for UTMB, like the San Juans or um, the Wasatch or Mammoth? Yeah, I mean, there's good places in the U.S. Uh, you can definitely get the training in. Um, American women have obviously shown that you can win in Chamonix uh, training in the U.S. I don't think any of the, I don't think Nikki or Missy or Courtney or Rory, like any of them trained abroad um, more than any of the men that are doing it. So, um, yeah, obviously you can get it done, but, um, kind of just goes to maybe some of the combination of frustrations of not feeling like I've performed, like I know I'm capable of at UTMB. And I mean, I think the biggest obvious answer is that Western States for me has taken up so much energy and focus, but, yeah. um, there's so many other parts of improving out here in the Alps that I think I can do that. I think I'm just, uh, basically taking steps in so many other facets of my trail running and mountain running that, um, 
I, I hope will come together and, and make me a lot stronger and more kind of resilient to survive good days, bad days, and every day out in a hundred miles in the Alps. Like, I think that's kind of more the goal is to learn how to survive better out here rather than mm. um, do that. But probably the most like straightforward advantage is just the lack of travel beforehand. There's no yeah. like uh, adjustment period. And I guess it's a 10, no, it's a 6 p.m. start. So um, it's kind of a weird start for Americans anyways. And it's actually pretty good timing for Americans. If you don't switch at all, uh, it would be a nice morning start. But um, in reality, I think it goes more to just your feelings and how you feel in the lead up of the race. And it's always, or it's usually been a little bit of a struggle after travel to, to kind of find that um, mojo again and, and sometimes the pop and what do you do? Do you do more or less? And um, it's always kind of trying to feel that balance. And I'm, I don't like having to figure that problem out um, for UTMB. This is a little bit of a weird question, but I think it's important to ask because I think it has been a distinction for you at Western States, for example. When it comes to UTMB this year, are you racing the clock or are you racing your competitors primarily? Um, I think you have to look after yourself and look after your own effort. So I think it goes to kind of finding what's sustainable for you. But at the same time, like, um, what I believe I'm capable of, uh, puts me in, puts me out there essentially, uh, more times than not, I find myself near or at the front. And so, but that's kind of how I believe like Western States started of, uh, people similarly said it's too fast. It's stupid and whatnot, but yeah, more or less like the last two times I've lined up at Western States, I didn't care what anyone was doing. I just, or the last three times, even, um, I kind of stopped caring what everyone's doing. And I said, I'm going to run my pace and this is what's going to get me to Plaster High School and just mm -hmm. believing in that rather than trying to put in any surges or different paces and just taking my own time and pace through everything. Um, that's kind of how I found my um just a good flow for western states and that's kind of the plan for utmb this year is to find what i think is going to be sustainable what's going to get me through the night what's going to preserve my legs for uh champe lock and the last 50k um doesn't really matter if you have a lead or not um if you can't hold on to the lead then it doesn't matter and if you can't close a gap in front of you then it didn't matter like so, um, but I also think like my last two, um, races at UTMB, um, having two DNFs, it puts more into pressure of like really dial like making sure I don't overdo it and make sure that I find that sustainable pace to, to complete the loop this year. Um, cause I think if, I complete the loop like um, it's going to bring in more positivity than the last two runs here at UTMB and the the goal is not necessarily to just be here for one UTMB the goal is to really dig into kind of a more cultural lifestyle here in France uh, become more uh, French I guess and do what they mm -hmm. do and train how they train and um, essentially it's a multiple year project, not necessarily, uh, a training camp to come out here for UTMB. Um, if, if this can turn into multiple UTMBs, then I would like that better than just trying to win this year. Um, yeah, I, I'm greedy and that would be great. I think anyone would take that. Well, I was just going to ask you, given that you're firmly embedded over there in France, and it sounds like this will be a multi-year project, it could happen this year, could happen next year, but in the grand scheme of things, is anything less than a win at this event, a disappointment from a competitive standpoint for you? Like, is that firmly top of mind? No, um, I think that's pretty uh, easy to answer that not winning is completely like fine. I think it's uh, important to take the jump and 
realize that you can fail and failure could happen. But um, failure, failure is actually probably the most likely outcome, actually, um, for most people trying to do it. Like one person gets to win a year. So that's not that's not many. So um, I think it's more fun and I'm really enjoying the process to just choose another goal to put all my effort into. And I think the process to come here to to pick up more and more French, to make friends over here, to figure out life over here a bit. Um, it's making me grow as a person and not just a athlete. So I think in the grand scheme of things, like there's a lot of cool stuff that comes along with this goal that I'm trying to embrace um, in addition to just making UTMB is a catalyst and kind of the excuse to do it. But at the same time, like, uh, life isn't UTMB, life's not trail running, life's not a uh, sport. So, uh, there's a lot more fun to be had out here. And, um, I'm looking to do a lot of that while I'm out here in Europe too. Well, I got to say, before we keep going, I got to salute your, uh, comfortability with taking on risk and failure again, I think in the long run, especially for athletes that are coming up in the sport, it sets a great example of how, how you can approach it. And, uh, so I just wanted to say that, but one more question on this front, and I'll say this acknowledging that I feel like Americans treat UTMB like a proxy for the Olympics at ultra running. Like we, we treat winning this race, like a, you'd get a gold medal. Many Americans have tried. I'm sure you'll get this question 10 times over the next two weeks. Um, there've been athletes that like Tim Tollison and David Laney that have flirted with wins in the past and they're here this time around too, but are you the best suited American to get the job done when it comes to potentially winning this race in your mind? Um, well, I guess like your last point is just in my mind. I think in my mind, I believe I'm the best in Tim's mind. I think he should believe he's the best in Zach Miller's mind. I think he should believe he's the best. Um, I think Seth Swanson's back in it. He should believe he's got just as good of a shot as anyone is surviving it. He's shown he's gotten fourth here in the past. Like, He's really strong and survives really well in the mountains. Um, I think a lot of people should be believing in themselves more than anything. Like it doesn't, uh, it doesn't help to believe in someone else. I think, uh, believing in yourself is the only thing that's going to help you like get there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I genuinely believe in myself and believe that I'm capable of winning UTMB. And, uh, so I'm trying to train appropriately and with that goal in mind. Right on. A couple more questions. I'm curious, given that we're about two weeks out, are you someone that likes to follow competitors in the lead up to race day? Do you like to follow all the media circus or yeah. um, are you someone that likes to tune out and sort of go off social media and go in like meditation monk mode, <laughs> reading books and like just going about your day in peace? I mean, I think different races are different. Um, I feel like most athletes uh, that are running UTMB aren't logging everything, um, or aren't logging at all. So it doesn't really matter. There's no training to go watch. Um, so not, yeah, it, it helps almost with less people on there. There's not anything to care for, but I feel pretty confident in how consistent my block's been for months now in that, um, and I guess at this point in my career, I feel confident in myself and I feel confident in putting in just a consistent workload without having to try to boost up extra numbers just because um, I think I had one week get a little out of control, but that was because I was having fun running around Mount Blanc with some of the French Hoka athletes. And uh, I wasn't going to say no to that. And all of a sudden I, I put in a pretty big week, but it also had a bit of its repercussions with, um, recovering from it and having a bit of a little calf strain that I dealt with for a few days and didn't run. But I mean, uh, yeah, everything I've done so far is, is on Strava and I'm not hiding anything. I am confident in what I'm trying to do. And, um, yeah, we'll see. I'll, I think I'll do some, some shorter stuff to kind of see and hope that 
maybe I'm as fit as I hope I am, but uh, hopefully there's a bit of confirmation and confidence taken away from some harder efforts between now and the, and the race. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. At this point, we got what we got and we're going in with it. <laughs> well, and, and granted, we're we're two weeks out from race day right now, so there's still a lot of time to absorb the work you've been putting in this summer. But can you give the listeners any sense to how fit and rested you are at this point compared to where you were in like 2017, 18, 19 heading into this race? Not really. I don't have much to to give anyone confidence that I'm doing it more right this year than I've <laughs> messed up in years past. Um, I mean, yeah, ultimately, I, I don't feel like I've uh, figured out how to get the best out of myself at UTMB. So part of it's like, I'm not surprised of any day I have out there. And I'm going to just try to prepare for the day to get really hard no matter what. And <laughs> In years past, it shows that the day gets hard earlier than daytime. It actually gets much harder in the night and to uh, to get ready for a hard, long night and um, be ready to push through that as best as possible. There's, there's, no, It's kind of the beauty of ultra running. There's no way around it. It's going to get hard. So um, just leaning into that, embracing it. Um, and... Uh, yeah, we'll go from there. We'll try to take care of the stomach. And then I think after that, if the stomach's good, the energy's better. And if the energy and stomach is there, then it doesn't matter what the legs say. Uh, you're able to, to tell them to shut up at that point. <laughs> Last question. It's a little bit philosophical and it doesn't have as much to do with you, Tim. It's more just like panning out into the, your whole career. Um, I'm curious at this point, you're in your early thirties. Uh, are you still super stoked on ultra running? Like, are you, do you still love this as much as the day that you got started, you know, five, six, seven years ago? And yeah, just talk about that for a second. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I think I kind of describe it as, uh, your motivation and your goals have to morph and change throughout your life. I've seen it from, I mean, I, I consider myself pretty competitive in high school and a little bit in college. And like, I've been chasing it for a while. And then since starting ultra trail running, my goals have changed and it was very predominantly like with Western States there and then learning so much about the sport as I've already been in it. Um, so the goals are constantly evolving. Um, I mean, and I think you have to keep adapting in order to stay competitive because it, you'll either accomplish what you've been chasing eventually or you'll fail trying and at some point you call it good but if you can keep changing your goals then i think you can maintain being competitive and relevant so um there's that i think as far as ultra running um i mean western states was definitely a big motivation and fire for me so to kind of feel like i've taken a step back from chasing Western States, um, is different. Um, it was kind of nice that I, I actually ran from Cormier to Chamonix with, uh, my friend Johan Lance that night. So we were able to follow all the race and stuff. So that was pretty exciting and kind of a fun way to be a fan of it for a day instead of being in it, but also on my own adventure, um, with, uh, kind of helping me keep in mind that I'm out here with other goals. And then, um, but yeah, I mean, UTMB is a different style of running than Western States or than Lake Sonoma or the North Face 50 mile sort of thing. Um, getting used to the hiking, the slower pace, the eating, the, I mean, I still hate the pack, like <laughs> it's heavy, it's bulky, it, I sweat through it the whole time. But I also appreciate that the pack kind of allows me to go further on adventures. I'm able to carry self-sustaining gear to to be more prepared and, and whatnot. So there's definitely an appreciation for it too. Um, and then, I mean, talk about like kind of point-to-point -point travel sort of stuff you can do once you start carrying more food and bottles with the pack and, the, and then slowing it down to a lot more power hiking. Um, it, it's pretty cool. Um, but... 
if you asked me in high school, college, like I never would have gotten motivated on this. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely really stoked to train and perfect kind of doing better in the mountains. Um, and UTMB is kind of that catalyst that I'm training for right now. And I don't know what the next goal is. I, I'm not sure what my schedule will be even next year or even after UTMB. Um, I think I'd like to do one more race, but um, I kind of got to see what's going on uh, with the body and how I react. But um, yeah, you, you got to evolve. And right now the stoke is pretty high on UTMB. So that's about all I can kind of ask for at this point. Well, like if you had to guess, would you, do you see yourself being like a Tom Brady in this sport where you just infinitely want to be at the top? Or do you imagine yourself having these very concrete set timelines of like, I just can't see myself doing this past 40, for example? No, I don't want to grow up. So I'll keep doing it as long as I can, I think. Um, I mean, I think uh, I've made it past literally like 2000. 16 17 years of like when are you gonna burn out like aren't you afraid of that and it's like well at least i'm still here doing it so i think i've made it at least what most people would really like as far as a career and i and then you see um plenty of other people in their 40s uh approaching 50 and stuff i mean jeff browning is still crushing at 50 um yeah ludo pomeray uh yeah absolute beast mode hell leading out western states this year um i'm just sitting there like don't let that guy go he's gonna get away <laughs> but um yeah so strong and i mean i think actually as far as i mean yeah i, I look at other people on strava because it's kind of interesting i'm still a fan of the sport but i think ludo put has put in the biggest week out of anyone i've seen this year after western states and before uh i think what will be tds for him uh i think he put in 198 miles oh just gosh. insane at like 46 47 years old well jim yeah. honestly it has been it's been such a pleasure to chat i'm i, I think i speak for everybody in our universe that when i say we are uh going to be on the edge of our seats with the popcorn ready getting ready for you to be <laughs> i'll make sure to link to all of your social media in the show notes and any of these wahoo documentaries that come out um, before we go, anything else you want to leave the audience with? Any parting thoughts? Ah, send prayers out there. We're gonna. I think we're gonna uh, be in full send mode, and uh, we'll, we'll need everybody's support. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited, and I, I don't know. I tend to have a knack for making it exciting for people to watch, even if it's painful for me. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited for it and ready to go to the pain cave. <laughs> 